All right, let's just open a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share your word at this time on a very important topic. We ask that you will just open our hearts and our minds. We ask you to give clarity to both the speaker and those who hear. And we pray too that if there's anyone, Lord, who is, doesn't have a personal relationship with you, through your word this morning, they will be encouraged and, invite, and, and be convinced to enter into that personal relationship. We thank you and depend on you now for the continued working of the technology. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to call this certainty of the second coming of Christ. Peter, in his writing, obviously against the background of... Ah, so side slow ends. Obviously against the background of... Um, false teachers and scoffers he says in the in the, the church at the time um casting doubt and i'm certain in today's world there are lots of people like that who cast doubt on the second coming of christ and so he wrote about it to encourage the believers not to get led astray by the arguments and the detractors and distraction. And so I titled when I read it, I see that what he was doing was really tying the certainty of the coming of the Christ to some past events and, 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 and certainty of God's action and God's words. And so those are the thoughts I want to share this morning. I want to start though by reading a commentary from uh, author and theologian Henry Thiessen. He was making a comment on the Lord's second coming. I'm going to read. The early church was keenly interested in the doctrine of the return of Christ. The apostles had held out the possibility of his returning in their day. And the next generations kept alive the blessed hope as something that was imminent. Not until the third century was there any great exception to this rule. But from the time of Constantine onward, this truth began to be rejected until it was almost entirely set aside. It is only during the last hundred years or so that this doctrine has been revived in the church. I'll continue reading Thiessen. It is clear that the blessed hope was the incentive to apostolic Christianity. In other words, this is why those early Christians and the apostles lived their life because they were incentivized, motivated, by the thought that the Lord was returning. The men who had heard Jesus say that he would come again could not be again seduced by the allurements of this world. They longed for his coming, lived for it, sought to lead others to him and to the hope of his return. And you could, you could feel it in, Pete, in the reading this morning as Peter addressed the early Christians. So let's start. This is, this, is, this is supposed to be not my first slide. Let me write. So Peter is saying, listen, guys, the second coming, the return of Christ is definitive it it will happen because scriptures say so and he let me just read for you this starting at verse um well he says in verse he says in verse one that verse 2 that you be mindful of the word that was spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of the of us apostles of the Lord and Savior. So he's saying that 
remember now, this was predicted by scriptures, prophecies. Daniel wrote about it. Isaiah made reference to it. It is all true out. In fact, the, the, in, in a way, the second coming of Christ is the, what should I say now, is, is, is what pulls together a lot of the teaching and doctrine in the Bible because they all point not only to the first, but they all point, for example, this morning we had breaking the bread. What is the rationale for the breaking the bread? Although we are, we are commemorating his, what he did is his death and resurrection. We are looking forward to that blessed hope when we'll stop doing this. So right throughout the Old Testament and more so the New Testament scripture, scriptures, there is the reference to the second coming of the Lord. Nowhere is it better um, explained than in Revelation uh, where John writes. Let's look at, let's just read Revelation. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. It speaks to something that Peter mentioned in this, in his writing here, which we'll come back to. Revelation 20 and verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them revelation 21 verse 1 then i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea i've actually jumped to my second point by mentioning those events but the real um there are a lot of scriptures particularly in thessalonian that speaks about the second coming of the lord and peter himself writing about it so scripture as 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 said so and scripture has proven itself over time so I want to move on to the second point because I think this is what Peter has pinned his argument on. Peter is saying, listen guys, past events have proven that two things. One, that God can do what he says he will do. And so he makes reference to the fact that um, God created the heaven and the earth. Let me just pick up the verse there. Verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. The meaning created it, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Where were the world that? And then he moves on to the flood. I won't touch that yet. So he's making the point that this same God who was able to create the world, the earth, out of the, the disorder and darkness that was there, that same God has the power and the ability to, because what Peter has done is in his response here is to link the second coming to the fact that when Christ You'll notice I'm just touching on these things in a very introductory way because we're going to have teachings on it. So he links the second coming of Christ to what John wrote about in Revelation and other scriptures mentioned, which is that the earth, the old earth as we know it, will pass away and there will be a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation, which I just read. And so he's saying that, listen, since you guys seem to be doubting this, that the Lord will come back, and when he comes back, so, these things will happen. Well, I'm telling you that these things and similar things have happened in the past. Hmm? So he's saying the certainty of the second coming to past events. The same God who, who made the world out of this all that was then, as explained in, in Genesis, the creation story. It is the same God who, when Christ comes back, will transform 
And the scripture says, burn up this old heaven and earth as we know it. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So he's tying it. The certainty of the second coming with the events that will accompany it. And he's saying, just as how these happened in the past, but so oh God proved that he could do it. He can do it again. And not just that he can, he has the ability, but he will do it again as he has done in the past. And it's because his word is reliable. And so, verse 6. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And he's making reference to the fact that um, the flood, Noah warned, warned and warned and warned for years, and nobody paid him any mind. And then you saw when the, um, the earth was, was, was open and the fountains of the earth and up gush water and water from top to and there was the flood. And he's again, so Peter is tying the certainty of the coming of Christ to past events and also coming events that God was able to do in terms of his ability, but also in terms of his certainty of his word. And so based on that, Peter is saying, don't let these guys fool you because as sure as God created the world, as sure as, as is as certain that he will also recreate it. And in that recreation, it is part of the second coming of Christ. That's what he's saying. As I said, I am really making an introductory um, um, approach to this teaching that we'll do in more details in August. All right, so that's the second point I want. The first point I made was prophecy and scripture say so, that he'll come, and that past events, which is the burden of Peter's um, writing here, uh, prove that, that um, the certainty of him coming. And then he says a very interesting thing. Verse 9. Oh, well, let, let me mention verse 8 first. But beloved... Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. What he's saying is that, yes, we are looking at this thing through human eyes, but from God's perspective, is, is, is delay in sending back the Lord is not a very long in terms of God's um, understanding of um, and time, and time is not for him really. Time is just a human construct. God is eternity. But it really is not a long time. But even more important is the second point that Peter makes in, in um, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. In other words, he will come. But, and here's the key thought, but he is willing that, that any should not perish, but that all should come to repentance. So part of this delay, part of the reason why God has not come yet, uh, sorry, sent his son, is because he's giving sinful man Kind, more time for repentance and salvation. In a way, if you if you if you switch this around, it means that um, God is certain to come um, because He's giving man a chance to get saved. Only that make any sense. But He will come. But He will. His timing of His coming is when he feels that he has given mankind, when he deems that he has given mankind enough time for repentance and salvation. And wouldn't we want, 
those of us who have unsaved friends and family and so on, wouldn't we want this time to continue a little bit the delay so that we are able to utilize a chance to convert, to assist in the conversion of our family, friends, and associates? God is not willing. So yes, we are here saying, oh, I'm not coming and why won't come? And he's saying, I want to make sure that all get the opportunity and the chance for repentance. And in a way, that also speaks to the certainty because we want to make sure that others get saved. So, the certainty of the coming of Christ is linked to prophecies and scriptures. Um, God's past actions in terms of creation and phenomenal events in nature and the certainty of his word but also he is giving sinful mankind a chance for repentance i want them to move to our second set of, of um, points which is what then should be the christian's response Peter says, as certain as God created the heaven and earth in the first time, he's going to come back again, recreate it, along with the coming, the second coming of his son. What then should be the Christian response? What then should we, those of us who call ourselves born-again Christians, do in response to all the scoffers, scoffers and disbelief? Verse 11, verses 11 and 14 are instructive. 2 Peter 3. See then, seeing then, that all these things shall be dissolved. It's talking about the heavens and so on. What manner of persons ought you to be in all conversation and God? Conversation here means behavior and godliness. So the first point I see there is that we should be, because of the certainty of the second covenant of Christ, we should be living godly, godliness. Verse 14 expands on that. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blemish. So, we shouldn't be like this covered and the unsaved man and saying, Oh Lord, God now come again. So and we should be saying, because of the certainty of him coming, how should he come and find us? And Peter is saying, in all holy conversation and godliness and diligence and peace without spot and blemish. All right? And there are other um, encouragement there. So God the living, we should be living more godly as we await his second coming. What should be the Christian's response? Verse 12. Looking for and hasting <laughs> the coming of the day of God. So we should be looking for it. Now, a lot of us uh, many of us on this line and they probably ask us about the second coming of the Lord and we can, we can more tell you about our plans to continue living down here. Nothing is wrong with that, but we can eagerly tell you about all those plans and it is as if the second coming of the Lord is maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.4 down on our list because if it is, then if it is higher, then despite all the other plans we have, we must live in a way to expect his coming as the first point um, um, encourage us, God living. But this verse, verse 12 is saying, we should be eager. We should be waiting eagerly for his coming. Eagerly. Which is why I started off with the commentary that um, in the past, the early disciples and the early church Christians eagerly looked for it. 
And there's no reason why in today's world we should not be eagerly expecting the coming of the Lord and hoping for it. Because as Peter is saying, it is as certain as God creating the world and his plan to recreate it. It is as certain as that. It is as certain as God saying that the floods will happen and the floods happen. Therefore, let us live in hope and eagerness for his coming. Verse 12. There's another response that a Christian should have. And that is, which I think, by the way, is, what is, is perhaps the, the major response Peter is asking for, which is that we need to be alert and watchful. Verse, if we, if we turn over to verse 17, verse 17 says, Therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, Beware, beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. So we have to be careful that we don't end up um, in a backslidden stage, grow cold in our walk and our faith because we have succumbed to the secular teaching um, all the materialism going on in the world, all the overambition, uh, all of that, the dream building and so on. We have lost, or uh, we have been seduced, I want to say, by those arguments and those lifestyle. And we have put, and we have more and more um, reduced the importance or, of the second coming of Christ. So we have to be alert. And watchful, because sometimes these things just undermine your, 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 your attitude, undermining your belief, and you, are, you get caught up with it, and you're not aware that indeed you are not emphasizing the importance of this. So those are a few thoughts I want to leave with us this morning as we begin to prepare ourselves for this study on end times, um, touching on all those eschatolic, you know what, leave it alone. The end times events as they come. So let me just summarize. So the certainty of the second coming of Christ is supported by prophecies and scriptures. It's supported by the past events that God has, has, has done. And, and, and we should not, we, I, I should not overlook the fact that one of the past events is the first coming that indeed was prophesied throughout the Old Testament scriptures. And as we, as we, as we read in Galatians, the fullness of time, the right time, the appropriate time, and, and um, historians and Bible scholars um, would tell you that the time was the right time based on world politics, world geography, the state of sinfulness, the, the, the fact that we know other, 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 other world language that, that um, we could uh, use to, to preach the gospel, but the time was right. And uh, God came in flesh to dwell amongst mankind. And so that first one was certain and happened, this first coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ is no less certain. And so we are to prepare ourselves and live lives that are worthy of his coming. Part of that living life is to ensure that we ensure that we spread the gospel and seek to win our unsafe friends and relatives. So I want to close on this. And as I close, um, I'm going to take a look at a look at the chairman's rights. <laughs> I'm certain he'll support me afterwards. And to just thank and welcome those of you who have joined our meeting 
Um, you're, you're usually not a part of the Zoom platform. You may have joined us on YouTube. So whether this is your first or second or repeat visit, we thank you for joining with us this morning. We want to keep you um, interested and in coming back for the rest of the series, particularly starting next week with a great tribulation. And so we will keep you informed and we invite you to invite other friends to join us in this series. Um, as I close and hand back to the chairman, if there's anything I've said that interests you, please feel free to send us a note on our, which our, our email. We'll, we'll, we'll show you those afterwards. Drop us a note. And if there's anyone who heard what I said this morning and you are not in a personal saving relationship with the Lord and that's something you're interested in doing or hearing more about, we're going to ask you to drop us a line. In fact, you can drop us a line in the chat on this forum before we leave so we know what your number is or your, your email address so we can get back to you. So it is certain Jesus is coming back for the world to transform it, but he will come back as a judge for those who, are, who have not yet received him, accepted him, he'll, and then he'll be a rewarder for those who have received him. Where the, how do you want to meet him? As a judge or as a rewarder for his namesake?